You are listening to episode 66 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about my podcasting work, publications, and to subscribe to my newsletter, Check this episode's notes or go to pasdechipotle.com. Hello, my friends. As promised, I prepared a little episode, which incidentally will be the last of 2020, but not the end of season five, which will resume next year. Today, I want to share some reflections and make a balance about what has happened in 10 years since Mexican cuisine was included in UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage, and giving you some context about it and why it is particularly significant for Mexico. Also, I will give you some enticing highlights of the irresistible selection of titles that you will find in my Mexican-inspired Christmas wish list. And because this is a short, sweet, but busy episode, let's get right into it. I hope you enjoy it. Here on the show, you have heard me talk about the fact that Mexican food is listed as cultural heritage. And because I know you are always on the look for interesting facts, I thought this was precisely the right time to take a closer look into this, so it makes better sense for you when you read or hear about this. Now, there are many ways in which we can explore the origin, purpose, and use of cultural heritage and its relationship to food. So let's begin with finding out what exactly is tangible cultural heritage. Well, first, as a principle, it does not refer to um, a collection of physical objects like things you will find in a museum, like paintings, or even monuments or buildings. The key is in the word intangible, which refers to the living traditions and expressions that we inherit from our ancestors, and that, as communities, we do an active effort to pass them on to the next generation. These expressions can be oral traditions, all forms of performing arts, practices like festivals, rituals, and activities that are related to our special relationship with nature or even the universe. It also refers to the knowledge and skills to produce traditional crafts, and they are considered cultural heritage. In short, it really refers to all the practices that define a culture's particular identity. UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, in which 193 of the 995 countries in the world have a representation started a series of summits more than 20 years ago, in which the general purpose was to address the preoccupation of understanding the effects and impact that globalization has on traditional cultures. The general views about this is that there was a rupture between the traditional ways of life and transmission of practices due to the rapid changes in consumption habits enhanced by the cultural industries of predominantly Western cultures. 
and I'm really talking about American culture that has displaced around the world local traditions from clothing to music, films and food, of course, among other things. And it was only in 2001 that the Universal Declaration of Cultural Diversity by UNESCO recognized for the very first time that the spiritual, material, intellectual and emotional expressions of a culture are human rights and therefore should be protected as such. While it is shocking that it happened so recently, you might also be wondering why is this relevant? Considering the centuries of unspeakable acts of genocide, forced displacement, segregation and full frontal intolerance to religious beliefs, rituals and even languages in colonized nations, but also in many developed countries where racial and cultural minorities also have been subject to these abuses. Well, their cultural rights were now finally acknowledged and protected, at least on paper. So the big task was then creating a whole lot of legal frameworks to make sure that it actually happened. And I think you see where this is going. The United Nations General Assembly approved the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage in 2003. And to make a long story short, right after it, UNESCO urged all member states to apply for the protection of their expressions of cultural heritage. So Mexico rapidly got on working and produced a proposal that was called people of corn, the ancestral cuisine of Mexico. But this was rejected because it was considered as too broad. This decision was actually met with international criticism because the rules were not really clear and way too generic, so it was perceived as unfair. Nevertheless, in 2009, the second attempt came with a dossier called traditional Mexican cuisine, ancestral ongoing community culture, the Michoacán paradigm, which was successfully approved and officially listed in 2010 as the world's first protected food-related heritage of mankind. Da, da, da. And this is a very interesting paradox, because while the nomination is specifically focused on the food ways of the state of Michoacán, in practice, it applies to all of Mexico's traditional cuisine. Hmm. To give you other similar examples, we have the traditional food of Oshipalav and its cultural context in Tajikistan, listed in 2016, and the art of the Neapolitan pizzaiolo that was recognized in 2017. So, as you can see, it became clear that the key aspect of heritage protection was not the safekeeping of a simple group of dishes or an individual meal or an ingredient. Because for those things, countries can apply to the authentication of geographical origin authorities with the PDO or Protected Designation of Origin which is a status that some foods have, like parmigiano cheese, Colombian coffee, tequila or vanilla, and literally hundreds more individually protected food products. In contrast, UNESCO really aims for the protection of the relationships and resource management of natural and cultural resources and practices that, as a result, produce the identity of a group and means for their development. Mm. And here we have another key aspect of all this. Development. United Nations tried to shift the idea that development only meant economic growth and instead presented the idea of social and cultural development that would actually, well, benefited people and not just the market. So part of this idea of listing intangible cultural heritage traditions like cuisines was part of the strategy of activating these resources as part of the development of products that will generate income and growth. How? Well, 
actually very easy, by inserting them into tourism strategies, entrepreneurship programs, development of destinations, and so on. Meaning that, of course, it was not a casual phenomena that, quote-unquote, suddenly, cultural tourism and experience-based travel became a thing. Because there was a deliberate international effort to make that happen. And gastro-tourism is part of that. See how it piece makes sense now? Now, of course, there are great benefits from this, such as making visible the knowledge and skills of farmers, heritage crops, traditional cooks, and seeing a mixed heritage cuisine, like that of Mexico, under a whole new light. Because not too many decades ago, and <clears throat> I am old enough to remember, here in Mexico, indigenous food and certain ingredients were absolutely looked down and pushed aside as poor people's food, unglamorous and even embarrassing. Really, no one would have believed me back in the 80s that a world-renowned Mexican restaurant in the 21st century will become famous for serving insects, pulque and really old mole. After 500 years of dealing with the aftermath of the Spanish conquest, food became a wonderful vehicle to start healing our relationship with our mixed heritage and educating ourselves about our ancient traditions. And this is an amazing thing. However, not everybody agrees with the simplistic view of seeing culture as a commodity. And of course, this is a very complex and prickly topic that has kept social researchers busy for at least a couple of decades. And we can identify three different groups of attitudes towards the status of food as a cultural heritage and its use as a means for development. So let's see what these perspectives are all about. So we have one group that sees this phenomena as a really good way of recognizing traditions. And they are quite positive about the use of mythologies of food. And they are very okay with the romanticized way that it is presented and the way we talk about our ancestral food ways. Another group thinks that the way the government institutions and tourism industry presents a very simplistic idea of our culinary traditions is simply wrong because they paint a Disneyfied version of it. And that really has to do with the way outside Mexico there is also a simplification and really misrepresentation of our cuisine even going as far as creating stereotypes of a country where people ride horses, wear mariachi costumes and drink tequila while eating tacos all day. <laughs> well, the third group represents a segment of the food industry that has revisited Mexican food ways and traditional dishes by giving them a sort of reinvention but some might say it is whitewashing, because this is done with the use of classic French culinary techniques that make this food more appealing to an upper-class type of consumer. In this category is where we find the so-called New Mexican Cuisine restaurants, also author cuisine food and native cuisine. Their stylish versions are almost unrecognizable from the original dishes and often restaurateurs use crafts, textiles, music and other things as props for marketing and ambience. Some might even go as far as dressing up their staff with pseudo-traditional clothes and have ladies making tortillas right on the spot to legitimize the authenticity of the place which, as you can imagine, draws a lot of criticism. So, which is the answer, Rocio, you might be wondering? Well, it is complicated. Ten years since the listing of the Michoacan dossier have brought us many lessons, especially in the way we study, write and think about Mexican food. 
For instance, there has been an avalanche of works that study the meaning, function and uses of food in our rituals of conviviality, spirituality and even celebration of life. We have also gained more understanding by distinguishing the many culinary roots of our cuisine that can link it directly to Sephardi Jewish and Arabic foods. The important legacy of African foodways has also been recognized. And we are more aware than ever of our connection with the Far East that is very present in the delicious spices that enrich our dishes. And ultimately, we have understood that ours is the best expression of culinary ingenuity and fusion. We have come to recognize and value the overlooked knowledge and skills of traditional cooks, the importance of ancient techniques and the ritualistic function of ingredients. And finally, we are learning to create new ways to harvest from our past and build new traditions without appropriating the practices of our own people. It has been a long process. And in hindsight, of course, we have made mistakes. But we have also gained so much in terms of knowing our own history. And of course, there is still loads more to discover, grow and continue evolving. These podcasts and my ebooks and food tour are really an effort to try to make accessible and transparent what happens behind the facade of the craze for Mexican food and giving context to it, telling its history and making visible the work and craft of hundreds of generations before us, as told by an actual Mexican. <laughs> Meaning yours truly. And if you really think this show has inspired you, changed your perceptions or ideas about Mexico, its cuisine and culture, and made you more curious, well then, amigos, my work is done. Or rather, we are going on the right direction. So with that spirit of letting ourselves drift into a journey of discovery, let's go to the second part of today's episode, in which I want to give you some super enticing highlights of the books you will find in my Mexican-inspired Christmas wish list. No need to make a mental note, just head to this episode's notes or go to my website pasachipotle.com as I continue talking and go download your free copy. I absolutely believe that inspiration is not a mythical muse that comes every now and then, but rather the result of an attitude that allows us to keep our eyes open and ready to be surprised by the most unexpected situations. In the section Inspiring Cookbooks, you will find new and classic titles of cookbooks And one of my all-time favorite from which I have cooked almost every recipe again and again. And that is Frida's Fiestas, Recipes and Reminiscences of Life with Frida Kahlo. This book was written by Guadalupe Rivera Marin, one of the many children of Diego Rivera, but the only one of them who actually developed an intimate relationship with Frida when she got married to Diego. The book is cleverly divided in months rather than plain chapters, and each month covers the events, stories, and foods that marked the important occasions for this eclectic family, and it opens a window into the intimate world of Frida and Diego with their ups and downs through anecdotes and the innocent memories of a child who happened to grow up in the bosom of a larger-than-life couple. The recipes are all classic Mexican foods, drinks and desserts that will make you feel as if you're sitting down with them as old friends. Road to Mexico is a fascinating book by Rick Stein, who is a very well-known and loved cook and restaurateur in Britain. He created this book as a way to retrace his footsteps after the first trip he made to Mexico many, many years ago. This book is actually best enjoyed with the TV series of the same name, in which Ricky shows a brilliant attitude towards other cultures, which is one of utter respect 
careful approach, and he does put a big effort in framing the cultural significance and function of food, and why it is special and meaningful. I absolutely enjoyed the series and have also cooked quite a few dishes from this beautiful book. I also feature books by Yvette Marquez Sharpnack and her mischievous Latin-inspired cocktails, Meli Martinez's debut cookbook, The Mexican Home Kitchen, uh, which you have already heard all about in my previous episode, and Fanny Gerson's James Beard nominated cookbook, My Sweet Mexico. There is a special section in the catalogue featuring them with links to their social media and also a link to listen to their interviews on Pase Chipotle. I have a page almost entirely dedicated to Diana Kennedy's books like Oaxaca al Gusto and the Art of Mexican Cooking, which of course goes hand in hand with my other recommendation, Elizabeth Carroll's documentary Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy also featured on the podcast. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, we are not makers of history, we are made by history. In the section called Gastronomic Reads, you will find many of the books I have recommended and used over the years to document some of the episodes. You will find titles like Rituals of Corn, Cultivation and Culture of Cacao in Mexico, and a gorgeous mammoth of a book called Alcohol and Nationhood in 19th Century Mexico, which explores the construction of Mexico's cultural identity and the class and race tensions manifested through alcohol consumption. This book was written by Dr. Deborah Tonner, an alcohol historian from the University of Leicester in England, and a friend with whom I have shared lovely food-related projects and was a guest of the show a few years ago. Now, when it comes to arts, Mexico is but an infinite source of inspiration for painters, photographers, and architects who have created world-renowned styles and iconic works such as photographer Lola Álvarez Bravo, who captured intimate portraits and scenes in Oaxaca in the early decades of the 20th century. Another book is by Mariana Jampolsky, that captured the fascinating moments of human connection and intimacy in rural Mexico. And of course, I had to include the gorgeous book by anthropologist Susan Barbesa, Frida Kahlo at Home, which will take you into a journey discovering the many layers of history of the iconic Casa Azul and how Frida made of it a self-contained creative universe. Now, speaking of many layers, in the section Social and Cultural History, you will find a title I absolutely recommend, which is called El Cinco de Mayo, An American Tradition by David Hayes Bautista. And I made a reference to this book in my episode about Cinco de Mayo. And in essence, is a story of a community that woke up to a new reality in which they were neither American nor Mexican. Disenfranchised and discriminated, they saw in General Ignacio Zaragoza the hero they needed that united them all and became a symbol of their identity. You, you have to read this. Now, for another section of my catalogue, I partnered with previous guests of the show, such as Lori Sandoval, founder of Salsaology, and Jorge Gaviria, founder of Macienda, Viridiana Velarde, co-founder of Merci Mercado, and Nicole and Roberto Reina Macrinos, who uh, founded Voladores Vanilla. All of these award-winning companies have at their heart a deep passion to honor the food ways of Mexico. So by supporting them, they will continue supporting farmers and producers on both sides of the border. I also wanted to include Karina Mora, who offers gorgeous fine photography of Mexican landscapes and scenes, and Mayra Camacho's adorable handmade dolls that showcase her own family embroidery traditions from Amealco de Bonfil in Querétaro. 
all of them offered very kindly promo codes for you to get a different gift for yourself or a loved one this Christmas that will keep them smiling. Now, I don't know about you, but I really agree with Jorge Luis Borges and his famous words. I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? In the literary scapes section, you will find the heartwarming novels of chocolate historian and fiction author Alex Hutchinson, aka Penny Thorpe. I featured two of her books, The Quality Street Girls and The Mothers of Quality Street, that follows the lives of three women inspired in real-life former chocolate factory employees from the renowned factory in Halifax, England, that produced the very well-known Quality Street Chocolates brand. Alex was a guest on the show talking, of course, about chocolate. And if you haven't listened to that episode, well, I recommend you do so with a nice cup of cocoa. Other amazing novels in this section are Laura Esquivel's Like Water for Chocolate and Ángeles Mastretas' Lovesick. Believe me, you won't be able to put them down until you finish them. And if, like me, you love a good bowl of popcorn, then in the movie nights section, you will find my recommended titles, such as Alfonso Cuaron's Oscar-winning Roma, also the raw and powerful films 1942 by Ridley Scott, featuring Gerard Depardieu, and The Other Conquest by Mexican director Salvador Carrasco, among other great titles. And last, I included a little section called Books on my Bookshelf, including some of the titles I have featured on my other podcast, Hungry Books, like The Edible History of Humanity by Tom Standage, Eggs or Anarchy by William Sitwell, that tells the story of Lord Wilton, who was the Ministry of Food in Britain during World War II. I recorded an episode dedicated to this book on my other podcast, Hungry Books. Other titles include Copenhagen, Food Stories and Traditional Recipes by Trine Hahnemann, and another very useful book called Will Write for Food, The Complete Guide to Writing Books, Blogs, Reviews and More by Diane Jacob. Also, there are dozens, literally dozens, of more amazing books to indulge your foodie passion. As you can see, you will have to make very tough decisions as to which books to buy before Christmas. But hey, you can still buy loads more after Christmas as well. Oh, and I almost forgot, I have also included special promo codes with discounts uh, for you to get my ebooks uh, with a reduced price. So go and treat yourselves. Now, before I say my final goodbyes of the year, I really want to take a moment to say a heartfelt thank you. Thank you for another year together. Thank you to all of you who have recently discovered the show and have reached out on social media. It is so nice to have met you. And of course, to longtime supporters, I couldn't do this without you. Also, I had the privilege this year to be invited to offer lectures on different topics like the history of Mexican markets for the Brentwood New York Library. Thank you, Peter Gard, for making it happen. I gave a super fun lecture on Mexican chiles to the students of the class, from texts to table um, of the Department of Romans, Languages and Literatures of the University of Notre Dame, Indiana. Thank you, Dr. Vanessa Miseres. You are a star. Also, I gave a slightly different lecture called A Path to Creating Impact with Your Research Outside Academia, specially designed for the students of the course on food, culture and writing in the early modern Spanish Atlantic. Thank you, soon-to-be Dr. Daniela Gutierrez, for challenging your students to pursue different projects. 
Thank you, thank you for listening. And of course, you know that this podcast is crafted with much passion and gusto by me, Rocío Carvajal. And as this roller coaster of a year comes to an end, let's not forget that in the face of fear and uncertainty, we have turned to compassion and kindness, to hug each other with our words and deeds, and to be a source of strength to those around us. I look forward sharing another year of discoveries, adventures, tales and conversations about Mexico's wondrous culinary traditions with you. I hope my work can continue bringing you joy and inspiration into your life. So goodbye, my friends. I send you much love and light. Until the next year.